All right, good morning, everyone. This open meeting of the Coastal Zanes Advisory Committee on uh, Tuesday, October 25th is convening via video conference pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 as extended on July 16th, 2022. This meeting is being recorded and all attendees are participating remotely via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Um, anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please silence all phones and devices. Members of the public wishing to participate in the meeting must use their full name for Zoom access. If full names are not used, people will not be allowed to participate in discussion. The town reserves the right to remove any member of the public from the meeting who doesn't use a full name or who acts inappropriately. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For items with public comment, after members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment to those members of the public that have joined the meeting via Zoom. Members of the public who wish to speak must state their names and be acknowledged by and speak through the chair. If you're not able to participate in the remote meeting, you may also submit comments to the Coastal Brazilians coordinator, Vince Murphy, to be read into the meeting record. His email is vmurphy at nantucket-ma.gov. Uh, confirming member access, I am Mary Longacre, Chair of the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee. Permit me to confirm all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Gary Beller? Here. Sarah Boyce? Here. Peter Brace? Here. Matt Fee? Here. Ian Golding? Here. Um, I think that is everyone we have with us at the moment. Um, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Vince Murphy? Here. And anticipated speakers, we have uh, Executive Director of the Nantucket Historical Association, Niles Parker, and also Ed Rudd. Hello. Thank you both for coming. Um, and finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. Um, the uh, first item on the agenda is an announcement that Cape Cod Climate Change Collaborative is hosting a free online net zero conference on Friday, October 28th. There's a registration link in our agenda. And uh, Vince has an extra announcement for that. Uh, yes, I am going to be one of the, I'm going to be on a panel discussion. I'm one of the three people on the panel. Um, the panel itself is at uh, 12.30 if people want to see that one. It's the last panel, it's the last discussion of the day uh, before the conclusion. Thank you, Vince. Um, the next item on our agenda is a discussion with the Nantucket Historical Association regarding their resiliency plans. Um, hopefully their WPI student project has launched and is going well. And also they're sponsoring a climate change symposium. So uh, thank you for joining us here today and hope you can tell us all about that. <clears throat> well, good morning. <clears throat> and thank you very much for the opportunity to join you and uh, to chat with you today. Again, my name is Niles Parker. I'm the executive director here at the NHA. Me is Ed Rudd, director of our facilities. Uh, I'm sure many of you know. We, after um, sort of getting my feet on the ground this summer and working closely with Ed and our board and staff and others in the community, are embarking upon a series of activities and initiatives with our properties. Uh, and in fact, we're starting to, to do an overview of all of our properties, you know, not just the properties downtown or in the water. Uh, that builds off of the 2018 report that you included in the packet that sent around. And so we're looking to update and refresh that and, and go to the sort of the next step that uh, includes uh, historic uh, structure reports for all the properties with an eye towards climate change and the impact that it will have on those properties uh, and how we might respond to each of those. But there's been quite a lot of work done over the last several years since that 2018 report came out. Ed's been leading the charge on that front and thought we'd, we'd start today by talking about some of the work that's taken place already at the Macy Warehouse on Straight Wharf. Uh, and so you can hear about some of that work uh, that builds off of that 2018 report. Hello all, uh, Ed Rudd here. Um, so I started with Thomas Macy Warehouse with Tom McGrath, who is no longer with us, but he was fantastic working with me on doing a resiliency plan for the Thomas Macy Warehouse. Um, so with the building, obviously, first we put the new slate roof on the building, uh, made sure all our gutters were working properly and tied in and tried to dissipate as much water the best way we could. Uh, along with that, going into the building, um, the building we decided was going to be wet flood proofing since 
there's no foundation, no concrete underneath the building. It's just rubble and dirt. Um, so going about that way, we decided to put all of our mechanicals hanging from the first floor ceiling or the second floor ceiling. Um, so that includes fire protection, all the wet pipings on the second floor, uh, well, hanging on the second floor and the attic floor. Um, electrical, same thing. We ran all electrical up all on the ceilings. Um, so there's nothing on, on the first floor ground besides just the water and the electrical coming into the building. Um, condensers outside for the air conditioning, we have set up at 46 inches, so above the floodplain for that area there. Um, and yeah, that's besides that, um, we have a lift and we didn't put a lit, uh, pit in the lift. Uh, we dropped the, the elevator lift in a pit area. So that's on the ground floor. Uh, we supported it by some framing woodwork for that. So we didn't worry about any sort of flooding coming into a pit lift. Um, and also finally was uh, installing storm windows around all the, win you know, the windows of the building. Yes. Thank you, Ed. Sarah, you have a question? Yeah, um, Ed, so I'm curious, um, with all of these different um, design and implementation pieces, was this based on kind of your own understanding or thinking through each piece of a kind of weatherproofing or like, as you're saying, like dealing with water, or did you have specific guidelines from like at the town level? Or I'm just curious, um, like, how did you know what to do? Or basically, was it one thing, or did you guys pull it all together from different sources? Uh, luckily, having Tom McGrath, who was head of parks, and so he's had, you know, 40-some-odd years of dealing with resiliency. And so he was great to come in and sort of, you know, walk through everything with us from doing the roof um, to the, the wet flood proofing. Um, he did a whole report for us, not just on Thomas Macy Warehouse, but all the other properties for resiliency. And for the other properties too, even though they're maybe not right in the floodplain, but we were looking at wind damage, snow load, electrical outlet uh, outages, um, lightning. So we tried to cover the bases as much as we could for everything. And Ian? Thank you, Mary. So, Ed, that sounds pretty comprehensive. Um, have you thought possibly, or from our perspective, of, of having a brochure at the entrance to anybody could pick up to explain the flood resilience? Because it, it sounds like a classic example of how you, we as a community could make uh, people more aware of what we're facing. Thank you, Larry. Well, I think that's a great idea. And actually, Niles is writing it down now. So thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, we could implement something like that. And, and I want to add, I, I was really impressed by the report because of the, all of the different things that it considered. And I thought that the fact that it's publicly available um, and, and that hopefully the NHA will um, continue to let people know about all the steps that you're taking is you know inspirational and a, a guideline for anybody who's in a similar situation to to think about all of these things. Um, so you know I think a brochure would be a great idea at the Thomas Macy Warehouse in particular. Um, and I hope that um, we'll be able to coordinate our efforts from the town's perspective uh, that will enhance the work that you've already done on your buildings and that other building owners will follow suit. Um, but thank you for making this public. I, I wonder if this might be a topic for your symposium. Well, I think it's a great segue into that next section, actually, because I think that's at the heart of what the symposium is all about. And <coughs> what we hope to be doing increasingly um, using our location here uh, to play an educational role in sharing that information with the visitors who come through the museum or through the Macy Warehouse uh, and, and have that information accessible and public for them. 
at the heart of the um, symposium in December, which was, uh, I think, inspired in some ways by Marty Hilton, uh, who I know many of you know well and have worked with and is past here on the island uh, and now in his role with the Park Service, looking at, uh, in effect, cultural properties that are in harm's way that are going to be affected by rising sea levels and, and creating sort of up-to-date best practice that those organizations might follow and that we could use as an educational resource to, to share with other organizations, both regionally, uh, around the country and around the world. There'll be, there'll be international uh, folks coming to attend this in December who are again, looking to update best practices and provide that sort of white paper or man series of manuals that cultural organizations can utilize uh, and sort of you know, look at best first steps that they might take if you're tasked with managing a historic property or a cultural organization that again is in, in, in harm's way with rising sea levels. And so that's that educational component really is at the heart and soul of this symposium that we'll be hosting here in December. It'll be taking place December 6th, 7th, and 8th at the Whaling Museum. The first two days will be uh, sort of onboarding for those uh, scientists and specialists who are coming to the island to talk, to hear about efforts that are going on here on the island. And so I'm very hopeful that we'll have time uh, for different organizations to share their work with the folks who are visiting the island, uh, as well as the town, uh, getting an update sort of on the latest events here on the, on the island. And then the third day will be an opportunity for the public to attend as well, to, to hear uh, the panel discussions and some of the talks that the scientists will be giving and the hope then again, as I said, is that they'll walk away with a series of um, manuals, white papers, uh, and they're actually talking about creating a Nantucket model that they'll be able to take to other uh, historic sites around the country, at least two others later in 2023, um, to be able to, to take this idea uh, around the country and again, to other cultural organizations who are dealing with this issue. So. Um, it, it's come together really quickly. This is something that Marty just uh, sort of got started in the middle of the summer here. And so we've been working to put the, the details together. Uh, and so stay tuned. We hope to be sharing more specifics in the next few weeks uh, about that. It will be recorded, uh, that public session on the last day. Uh, and again, we're hopeful that all of you who are interested here on the island uh, might attend for some or all of that, that session. Um, and I'm sure that uh, you're aware of our Resilient Nantucket publication that came out uh, after your report, but uh, you know, that's another resource for anybody looking at Nantucket as an example. Uh, if we can go to, to Peter Brace with a question before you continue. Yeah, Niles, um, taking the brochure idea just one step further, if you guys considered maybe doing an exhibit um, somewhere in the museum, a way to um, both say a little bit about what you guys are doing and um, what maybe a little mention of our, of the CRP. I just think with brochures, not everybody picks them up, but yeah. with, an, with an exhibit, you, you can't miss it. You're in the museum and there it is. And then my other question is, is long-term, has the NHA considered raising its crucial buildings that are downtown? Is that part of the plan long-term? So, uh, that is, I think, in consideration. And what, one of the things we hope to do is having folks here sort of crawling in and around the Whaling Museum and the uh, Broad Street campus here will be to help us determine whether that might be the best step forward or you know, parts of it. You'll see in the report that was shared the recommendation that what used to be the gift shop be raised as mm -hmm. our education center. You know, helping us sort of sort through the various options and permutations of best way forward, and that and Peter, that might be one of the one of the results that come out of that. Um, we'll see. Um, to your point about exhibits, uh, absolutely. And I did want to say that for any organization, it's the town, this committee, to have um, brochures, displays set up in the Whaling Museum during that symposium I think would be wonderful. We could have tables set up and areas available for those things to be out and distributed. So happy to, to work with you and any organization here on the island uh, to make that happen. 
But longer term, Peter, yes. And in fact, this gets to the third area that I wanted to talk about. We just started to work with students from uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute about a um, project for us is going to be looking at specifically the Whaling Museum complex and the entire block here and helping us create a ArcGIS story map for the site. That'll do a number of things, uh, including document where the electricity is coming in and out, the plumbing is coming in and out, sort of all the utilities, water flow, and it, they'll build layers that will allow his, both the inclusion of historic photographs and information, current information, and then some of the future mapping that's been done showing uh, likely water rise and areas of penetration in the site. We're hopeful that that could be the basis for an interactive um, map or exhibit both in the museum and on our website that will allow us to talk about the impact of rising sea levels, obviously not just on this block, but for this area of town and for the island as a whole. So I, th I think it has the opportunity to be a pretty neat interactive uh, that could be created using much of the work that you have already done, uh, that the town has done, uh, and that we hope to do in the next uh, months and year ahead. Thank you, Naz. That does sound like a really worthwhile project. And um, just to make sure you're aware, uh, Vince has stepped out for a moment, but we, the town is in the process of putting the uh, MCRFM, the Massachusetts Coastal Flood Risk Model, onto our town GIS system. So it will be available uh, as a resource there. And that may be helpful to you as well. Uh, we don't I, I, have a date for that, though. I know that the students have been in touch with Vince and he's provided them with some, I think, very helpful information already. And I imagine they're going to have more questions over the next couple of weeks. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Gary Beller. Yes, uh, thanks. Um, I think it's terrific that what, what you've done with that Macy's warehouse by moving the equipment as far up as you can. And it sounds pretty good, but uh, being a, a Brand Point resident, having recently built something there, in the last few years, I worry about your condensers because you said your condensers were 46 inches up. And my uh, what we were told when we were putting up a building across the street in Grand Point was that under FEMA requirements, they have to be over seven, over some, between seven and eight feet above sea level rise. And that's where all of our mechanicals are. Everyone on the street who does renovation has to have their mechanicals that high because of FEMA requirements. So uh, I'm a little worried about your condensers. I think everything else is sounds pretty good, but uh, if the condensers are 46 inches. Um, that might be okay for a few years, but I kind of worry about it as we go out further on the time time scan. Yeah, I think um, the back of the building and not trying to intrude on other people's spaces or site view. Um, is exactly what you're talking about is that for now till you know until we really have another big flood or if it's five ten years um, it's something that we'll have to revisit but for now from what we've seen of flooding at least we feel that we're comfortable with where the condensers are at this time thank you I'll also add that we're going to be taking the opportunity with the Whaling Museum site uh, on this block to likely uh, relocate some of our equipment. Again, you know, making sure that uh, we take this time to, to move it to a high enough high enough ground and protect what we can. Well, thank you both. It's great to see um, action moving forward. Um, sometimes, you know, with the town, there's a lot of talk and not much action. So as a private organization, you have a little more flexibility and can serve as an example. <laughs> well, we really are keen on working with the town, working with other organizations, private landowners uh, on doing this work. You know, we want to learn from what's already been done. I'm, having just gotten to the island again this summer, it's really apparent that there's been quite a bit of work and effort already done. And I've been trying to learn as much as I can. So thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to working with you going forward. Thank you. Gary, did you have another comment? No, no. The only other comment I have is that when we think about the problem with flooding waters, I keep thinking about some friends of ours who have homes in Naples and 
all of their cars were in garages in some of these condominiums. And everyone I know has lost all of their cars. So it's going to happen. We just don't know when. So anyway, I'm glad that the whaling folks have taken steps already. That's all. Thank you, Gary. Ed? Yeah, could I just say too that we're doing the same thing with the Whaling Museum, the Discovery Center that's on C Street. Uh, we're calling that building wet flood proofing too because it does have a concrete floor to it. So what we're doing now is pulling all the electrical out of the floor, bringing up all the electrical outlets up to four feet, three and a half, four feet. And it's sort of, it's going to vary a little bit. But at least we'll have at least 24 inches of sacrificial drywall that if we do have a huge flood, it's not going to hit the electrical system. And so we just cut out the drywall and replace, you know, clean out the studs and dry them out and then replace the drywall. Uh, the flooring in there is just old, very thin wood flooring that would be sacrificial too. Uh, we're trying to figure out right now decide on what would be the best flooring material that if we did want to replace over the concrete. Um, I've had buzz buzz saw here. We've scoped all of our drains at the back of the building, cleaned all our drains, made sure all of our downspouts were all connected to our main drain line, water drain line, which is a uh, storm flood water drain line. So I've had Phil Allen here and to check on our main uh, pump out, water pump out for storm drains. And we've cleaned that all out. Um, and we see a difference already in the backyard with any sort of heavy rain, uh, just from these small little steps. And so um, we're just continuing with that, but we are, you know, we are doing bits and pieces on each property that we can. And that's often overlooked. There's basic maintenance steps and preventive steps that can be taken that minimize the risk from, from flood damage. So uh, I, I was just really impressed by the work that, that you did with Mr. McGrath in the report. It was very thorough. Sarah? Thank you. Um, one other question, I you know, just to, to highlight for you guys, I don't know, you may have said this and I missed it because I'm, I'm typing notes, so I shouldn't have missed it. But um, this, you know, a lot of this work that's both the maintenance and then the longer term planning, the roof and a lot of this wet proofing, it must be quite costly. So I was going to ask if um, you've been able to find grants, you know, for protecting historic structures or, you know, at the state and local level um, or the federal level. I'm just kind of interested um, because both from our perspective, if we know of more grant opportunities that can help other historic structures, um, other historic properties, or if this is something that you've kind of just focused internal funding on? So uh, we are in the process of looking for additional grant funding uh, going forward, but we were able to get, to this is before I was here, but I know Mass Cultural Council funding to help with the Macy Warehouse, yeah. um, fairly significant funds to help with that project and some of the work that Ed, Ed has described being done. Um, uh, the rest of it was done with uh, private funds, uh, I believe, and funds the museum had already raised. But we're going to be taking a sort of a broad brush approach going forward and mm -hmm. trying to find all all sources of income uh, to help with the work that I know needs to be done, particularly here uh, at the Welling Museum site. Great, thank so, you. So yeah, I'm I'm my mall here, and would love to talk with people if there's a collaborative approach among various organizations or with the town. Um, Love to help be a part of that. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you again, uh, Ed and Niles, both for uh, coming here today. And um, it, I look forward to the symposium in December. I think that's a real public service that you're doing. And hopefully, you will also learn from it as other people come here to the island and bring uh, notes about what they have done. Thank you, Mary, and thank, thank you. you all. Thanks for inviting us to join you today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next item on our agenda is an update uh, discussion of CZM staff feedback on the unfunded grant application for the downtown neighborhood flood barrier phase one. Uh, so Vince and I and Trevor Johnson were able to speak to a couple of people from the Mass Coastal Zone Management Group. Um, 
And Vince, why don't you go ahead with the results of that? Sure thing, Mary. So um, we met with Patricia Bowie and uh, Steve McKenna. Steve McKenna is the Cape and Islands uh, rep from CCM. The feedback was interesting. They had a couple of very specific notes, a couple of high level notes. And um, just to run through some of those, um, they recognized the importance um, of this project and how it has critical nature, nature for the proposed project. Uh, they f uh, it fell in uh, competitiveness more than anything else. There were just such an enormous number of applications and high quality applications we were up against very, very stiff competition. We were certainly in the ballpark and we were certainly in, in play where they felt we fell down a little compared to other uh, other um, uh, proposed projects was the order of the tasks in the scope of work um, and the budget in particular. Um, so they wanted us to potentially look at less outreach. They saw that there was a lot of outreach included in the in the scope of work particularly in year one. They wanted to, uh, they thought perhaps cut that down, uh, have less outreach or find a different way of doing it, but don't make it part of a CZM application. Was, uh, if that's not unfair uh, to say, uh, and they wanted more of a focus on the engineering design. Um, they, moved, they suggested perhaps switch the activities of year two and year one and narrow down the list of options for year one in particular. Um, Steve was saying about more of a, a specific feasibility study and a focus on historic structures. Um, for the budget, they thought that some, it was nitpicky, I have to say this out loud. The budget was very good. We had it worked down to the dime, down to the penny even, sorry. Um, it was very high level, but they felt some of the percentages for some of the tasks were too equal to others. So there was three things that were about 15% of the time and budget, uh, of the budget rather. And they thought, well, it's hard to give equal um, budget scope to outreach as well as certain engineering tasks. They thought it was, um, there should be more of a focus on engineering for the sake of argument. Um, they were, uh, the end result was that they're happy to work with the town to improve the application and they can work with us right up to when the RFP is released. Last year, that was about mid-April or late April, if I remember rightly. But basically, almost starting pretty much now, they could start working with us on it again. Um, they don't know if there's going to be changes to the rules. They don't know that until the RFP. Well, they can't say that until the RFP is released. But they're certainly happy to work with us again. Um, but this did come down to this being a first-time application uh, they'd worked with others in the past um, where they'd gotten things up to standard. Uh, it, it, it's kind of sounded like if this isn't an unfair thing to say that there's people who go through one, two, three rounds, uh, sorry, two, three or plus rounds of application, they help them get it up to what they need from to fulfill a CZM grant application. So, so this is the first attempt they thought it was excellent, but just a couple of very small things that they would like to see changed for this to go forward for the next application. That does not guarantee success in a second or subsequent application, just so that everybody's aware of that. We got terrific feedback, but that doesn't guarantee much. Um, yeah, so there was 27 or so projects that were approved. Um, they didn't give us a number on the day that we spoke of the number of applications they had, but it was more than double that from what I understand. So we were in the top tier, but we just weren't selected. Uh, good effort, nice for trying kind of conversation. Uh, Mary was there too. Yeah, um, and so I'll add that um, they said there's no penalties to submitting a second time for the same project. So, so there's no reason why we couldn't submit again next year. And uh, one of the things that, that both Vince and I felt was that we do think that the public outreach is an important part of the project. And so the, the best way to have our cake and eat it too would be to go ahead with public outreach to prepare the way for the project, um, you know, uh, without putting that effort into the new grant application. So we can still do public outreach, um, but we have to do it on our own or through other avenues. Um, and having done that, 
we can feel better about removing or uh, reducing the public outreach component in the renewed application. Uh, so that, that's the general idea that, that, that Vince and I had um, from that meeting. Sarah? Thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, I had uh, two sort of points or questions. One was exactly what you just said about education and, I, and the outreach piece. Um, my suggestion was gonna be what we often do in our grants because we think about um, if they only have so much money to give out, we want the money for the thing that we absolutely cannot do without the money, which is the engineering piece and the kind of the higher level stuff. And so the education piece, what we usually do is we keep it in the grant, but put it as in-kind service. So it looks like they know you're gonna do outreach and education, but you're like, we're gonna take this on because it's important. Um, and then whether it's through crack or through other organizations in the town or, you know, like, like that can be something, whether it's acclimate or we kind of partner with other people that could be both a strength to the grant itself. But then the, the you know, as, as you said, that the outreach piece um, still, still comes through. Um, my other question to you guys was, did they any, did they say anything about whether, because I have, I saw the announcement of CZM grants, but I didn't go through each one and look at it. Were the projects that were selected more um, less planning and more like shovel ready projects? Was there a preference for projects that were like ready to go on the ground? I'm just curious if there was um, any pattern with that of what was selected. There was, if I could, Mary. Yes. Yeah, there was kind of across the board. There was a handful of those shovel ready projects certainly ready to go in there. There was a lot of planning, uh, say climate action plan type things uh, that for uh, some towns. Uh, there was also a lot of planning grants that were really similar to this. Um, so it was across the board. It was basically a scattergun approach. They they got the ones that they thought were most likely to succeed, I suppose is a, the politest way I could put it, but it covered everything you're talking about. Um, and there was no particular emphasis on any one of them. Um, there was everything. Can I yeah. ask a follow-up? <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Um, so, so then, Grant, uh, Vince, my question is for you. Um, for next steps, I know you're saying like you we could even start now or as you know, getting closer to April. Um, would you like help from this committee or a subcommittee of people to like help with it? Or I don't know, like for me, what are is there something um that you that like we could volunteer to help with or what what are your next steps? Good question. Um so we have an extremely well-written grant. We have pointers about how to make it better. I'd still like to work with Arcadis to help to, to get them to rewrite it and resubmit it. Um, they are going to have to redo the budget in particular, and that is what I'm going to need most help with. So if I'm going to need help with this, I'm going to need to understand what might be the financial cost and that kind of stuff. I certainly want the committee involved. No question on that front whatsoever. Um, I have always lamented the losing of the education subcommittee um I, I still like to bring up education on this um uh, as a frequent topic where i can so um another we have experience with subcommittees i've no issue with the subcommittee um we just have to bear in mind uh, membership of the committee and uh, turning up at other events as has been a problem in the past um so that just learn from our mistakes um or from what we learned along the way not necessarily that there were mistakes um Okay, yeah, I'm happy enough for that. Um, and or it could just be even an informal assistance from uh, experts uh, who are on this committee. I don't mind how you approach it, um, whichever works. Uh, this went through what two rounds of committee review. Um, let's try and do the same or again or more. Um, I'm, yeah, let's try and get this right. Uh, I'm also trying to explore other funding avenues that we could put this up for as well, um, because we could put this through for CZM application again and it could fail a second time. That is entirely possible. But the more grant applications or more funding sources I can put it in front of, somebody will eventually pick it up, I hope. And Trevor Johnson did indicate a willingness to continue mm. to refine the application. Um, so Vince has that uh, assistance available, hopefully. Correct. Um, I'd say that for the short term, we should look for opportunities to piggyback. Um, you know, the, the NHA symposium is a great um, opportunity. Uh, Vince, I think you were out of the room when he said that there will be um, space available for local organizations to, um, you know, set up a table or, or have a brochure or something like that. And that is definitely something we should pursue 
in terms of making the public aware of what's planned for um, the, the grant application. Um, so you follow up with Niles on that. <laughs> uh, I will I have to follow up with Niles on other things anyway. Um, and I want to add to the um, to the other announcements at the end in relation to the symposium. Um, and then we, you know, acclimate is another good suggestion. Um, you know, if, if if they are able to help get the message out, uh, or host an event, or uh, coordinate an event, you know, that that's another way that we can uh, connect with the public. Uh, Gary. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks for calling on me, um, Sarah. I would recommend that you take a look at the grants that were successful in getting selected because I think you will be as disappointed as I was when you think about the importance of our, uh, our request, considering some of the ones that were made successful. So it sounds to me, and since they were so, so complimentary about our application, it sounds to me like this is just a matter of, you gotta pay your dues, guys. This was the first time everybody else has been online and they're doing their hard work. We gotta take care of them keep it up and you'll get the next one or maybe the one after that. But, you know, you just got to pay your dues. So that's what I think. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Gary. I, I agree. That's kind of why I asked that question about like the shovel already versus planning. Yeah. Um, but I guess that this kind of prompted another question. I know this is, you know, outside of CZM, because I don't want to put all our eggs in one basket, right? And I'm assuming that um, you're looking at other grants, but I think, um, because this is like a bigger picture planning grant and it's, you know, obviously so important because it's like the town and Harbor and all that stuff. This is obviously a really important project that needs to, or the, and the planning piece. But I know that there's other, that are other projects that are maybe not shovel ready, but they're more um, action spe specific, like that still need some planning. And I don't know if there's like, um, I know that there is a list in both the, um, the the closer to Zancy plan as well as the, the town meeting thing where there was like a list of top things but do we similarly have like okay even within those what are the next steps like what are the next projects that we're writing grants for because I think it, it we have to diversify as much as possible because each grant application is a little bit different like CZM's great because it's big money and they do support planning but there might be some other opportunities that are like more specific to road stuff or more specific to salt marshes or I'm just making that part up but I I just think I, like us I don't know if, if it would help if we, we helped discuss what that is or if Vince is already on top of that totally and I'm way off base but just thinking about if we're only shopping around this one grant application um, even if we tweak it for different opportunities then we're still only getting this one project done so that's what I'm just kind of keeping it like let's keep going with other projects as well. So Sarah one of the things that uh, Vince and I have planned is a review of all 40 recommendations of the CRP you know sort of a one year later to see you know which have had progress uh, what progress they've had and just uh, ground ourselves in that reality uh, and I think that what you're asking is a great next step for that discussion to say okay you know here are the 40 projects and here's where we stand on them. Which ones can we advance you know, in the next year? So I, I appreciate your comment. Uh, anything further on this topic? Okay, uh, next item on the agenda is a review of the draft letter to the select boards to send to the Mass DEP. Uh, we have in the packet three letters, the original Conservation Commission letter, the letter that Vince and I drafted, and a letter drafted by Ian Golding, who introduced the topic originally. Um, I'm just going to say briefly that when Vince and I wrote our letter, um, we were picking up on the third paragraph in the CONCOM letter, um, feeling that that was the most appropriate um, point in that letter for us to comment on. So that was the genesis of what we wrote. Uh, Ian, do you want to introduce your letter? Uh, sure. Thanks, Mary. So um, I, I very much appreciate you and Vince uh, working on that. <clears throat> I felt that um, in and and this the sense that I get is that uh, the the waterways division of the DEP 
EP is overworked and understaffed. And so uh, I don't believe that, uh, Jeff, I don't want to put words into his mouth, but I don't think that uh, Jeff believes that we'll get any response. And um, we certainly haven't to date. And so I was hoping that our letter would focus on what is most important um, from CONCOM's perspective, which uh, is actually getting applicants um, for uh, uh, rebuilding bulkheads or repairing bulkheads to uh, address the issue that they feel is, um, uh, is, is out of CONCOM's jurisdiction. And so we, we actually have no say over the chapter 91 provisions, although um, we are, I'll, I'll discuss it later in our update of our regulations, which we had our first face-to-face -face meeting last week and tried to address this subject. Um, so even though uh, as an example, and, and forgive me if I'm repeating myself, uh, in 18 Washington Pond Road this past summer, where the bulkhead truly, clearly uh, intrudes into the intertidal zone to the extent that you can't even get past it at low tide normally, let alone at high tide when it's, you know, the water's four feet deep. Um, and concerned citizen reached out to CZM and uh, Julia Nissel um, wrote back finally in August, uh, emphasizing uh, that when erosion results in, a, in no fronting beach at mean high tide, then the reconstruction or repair of the structure will require a license from the Mass DEP waterways program that specifies how the property owner will maintain required public access. And when we actually quoted this lock, stock and barrel, we were still told that it was none of our business. And um, so I suppose, that's why I've, I've sort of altered the letter to focus on that as part of a long-term uh, approach to finally get them to deal with it. And I'm sure we're not alone as a community. In other words, there are communities around the state um, grappling with this. And from what I understand from Jeff, CZM is well aware of these issues and is sort of, um, you know, absent. Is, is trying to have everybody else sort it out rather than actually making a stand on it themselves. So um, that's why I quoted um, our you know, resiliency plan specifically. And that's why I asked them to um, actually uh, insist that all they have to do is state that applicants have to actually come to them first for a rebuild and it will completely change the dynamic because then it will guarantee basically that there is going to be public access in the intertidal zone. And as we all know, there are a number of bulkheads or if it's in the public interest, in other words, we're not talking about bulkheads done by a steamboat wharf. We're, we're talking about private bulkheads that are interfering with what is their statutory requirement as sea level rises. Thank you. So uh, Ian, before we get into some more of the details of the letter, uh, you mentioned the quoting the CRP recommendation and, and I have to strongly disagree. The CRP does not recommend the sentences that you've quoted there. The CRP reports them as input received from the community. Uh, so I cannot support using the CRP recommends uh, in preface to that quote. Uh, is it, I didn't I quote the summary. I thought it I quoted must, the it's summary. In the section, it, it is in the CRP. It's in the section of community engagement <clears throat> where it is reporting the um, input that was received from the community. It is not reporting on recommendations of the CRP. It's page 12. So, so <clears throat> so it says absolutely clearly, quote unquote, the CRP recommends that quote unquote, nature-based strategies should be implemented wherever feasible with a clear emphasis on minimizing ecological impacts and maximizing ecological and public access benefits. Preserving Nantucket's beach and coast into the future for as long as possible should be the primary goal. That's an absolute <laughs> quote on page 12. Uh, I do not see the CRP recommends anywhere on that. I see um, 
The process of committee engagement uh, identified a number of key priorities that help form the community's vision for a resilient Nantucket. So this is reporting on the community engagement uh, process and the input that was received. These are not recommendations. Well, um, then contained within the report. I mean, the bottom it's, line, it's, it's Mary, aren't language. we on the same page? We want to do as much as possible to move DEP to actually get, you know, put its, its uh, tenuous right. head forward to actually help us on this issue, which is an issue going forward that we're grappling with at CONCOM and, uh, you know, in the public interest. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with the, the use of the quote. I just want to make sure it is in the proper context because this has come up multiple times. So if we can say that the, you know, as reported in the Coastal Resilience Plan, the, what, one of the community's uh, priorities was that and then continue with the quote. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Peter has a comment. No, I just had a question uh, through you, um, Mary, to Ian. Does the rest of the Conservation Commission um, support your um, your version of the letter. Well, if they haven't seen it, um, uh, Peter. So, um, but they absolutely supported um, the original letter. So I feel that this is just a continuation of what was expressed in the original letter and what we've discussed at length in in the Conservation Commission. And in effect, <clears throat> rather than waiting till the end of the meeting, Mary, if I may, on, on what's been discussed recently at ConCom. Which yes, I think it's Thursday. appropriate. Yeah. Is it appropriate? Yes, I think so. Yeah, thank you. So we, we met in the, um, you know, the, the uh, shed by the old fire station face-to-face uh, -to, -face to discuss regulation, regulatory updates before we put them in front of the public for public input. And one of them, Jeff came up with a very ingenious suggestion that we try, that we change on, under our local bylaw, we have a regulate uh, a recreational component. Um, and uh, he is going to, I believe, he is going to wordsmith that recreational component to make sure that any of these applications have to abide by our local bylaw, which will specifically state within the recreational component that there has to be public access with um, any uh, repairs or rebuildings of bulkheads. So we are in our own way trying to deal with it at, in, within our local regulations because there is no very little movement at the state level on the issue. Peter? Yeah, um, in the original letter and in reading it um, and then reading Ian's, um, it kind of struck me that that if we can if we can accomplish what we're trying to accomplish in this letter and improvements can be made to the structures that we're talking about, it'd be great if we had our um, sediment transport study completed and our sand budget. And so that made me think to ask the question, where are those things now? I know this has kind of taken us off the off the topic, but if we knew where the sand was going and how much sand we had to play with, then then maybe these projects, I don't know. Just it would be germane to to to, to what we're talking about. Um yeah, I don't want to get too deep into those other projects. Vince, if you can quickly answer that. Just an update. Yep. Super high level um, sediment transport study uh, is in development, um, hopefully getting ready to get advertised in the very near future. Um, I've done what I can to get it to that level. Um, now it's um, waiting on others to progress um, to, to get uh, posted. Um, then we need the sediment transport study done before we can do the sediment budget study one is going to inform the other. So the sediment budget is going to take a bit longer. Uh, is about the easiest way I can explain that. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, Vince. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we know what those are going to say, that we need a ton of sand. You know, every time we talk about CO2 or anywhere else, 
there's not enough sand. And so, you know, we can wait and spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, but we need to find a sand source, you know, it's sort of when I cut through all, all the other stuff. And I think waiting on a sand source or a study to send this letter, I don't think we need to do that. Uh, I think the letter is fine. I think the adjustments that you put, Mary, are fine. Uh, you know, I, when I and when I think about this, I think about I, I agree with Jeff. I don't think that you know, that they're gonna the DEP is gonna do much. I don't think you know Chapter ninety one. They're not gonna do much. So I look at it and say, is there any way for Concom to just say we're not we're not gonna do this application until you give us a letter from them? You know, is there a way to do it through the regulation or just through their process that says, you know, you have to have this complete before you make an application to us, you know, and put the burden back on the applicant rather than on the town, you know, make the applicant go after them for this. You know, that's sort of, because I worry that we can, we can write this letter and they can ignore it or they can, whatever. And you're still going to be, Ian, you guys are still going to be in the same situ your, situation you're in. You know, is there a way to put the burden on the applicant so you aren't in that situation? So if, if I may answer, Mary, yeah. Yeah, yes, you're absolutely right, Matt. And so um, that's how we're trying to do an end run through our local regulation. But at the same time, um, you know, it, I, I just think like a letter of this nature that coming through us to the select board and hopefully the select board sending it on, you know, at, at some point um, it's, it's going to be the you know the final uh, push from a local community that will force them to act on this, and um, so uh, that that's why I would hope that we could uh, send this letter forward. Uh, Vince, um, I'm just trying to think out two different things based on some of what Matt was saying. Um, Sorry, I was scrolling up and down through the letter and just trying to get it to make sense to me. Uh, this is the big ask in this letter highlighted. In some ways, not greatly, but in some ways, I think this exceeds what was in the original letter from CONCOM in August. So this is a slightly different and slightly greater ask, very much in line, but there's a, a bit of a difference indeed. That's one oh. thing. So uh, the, the second thing that's kind of bugging me, I went off and I, after various conversations with Ian and at this committee, I tried to understand the doctrine of public trust as best I could and trying to get more information on it and trying to understand its intent, its implications and its enforcement. And here's where I kind of fell down. It's very well written, very simplistic very nicely written it stood the test of time it's the better part of 400 years old and has worked its way into chapter 91 and it does provide for access along the beach no question there and everyone has that right and you're supposed to be able to maintain that right but when i try to look at the enforcement side of it I, I i hit a problem and i think this is one of the big issues with it at the moment so if somebody breaks this law I, I'm having trouble seeing where the enforcement is. There's no fine. There's no recompense. There's no way of fixing it in an easy and straightforward and recognizable way. Um, so like you can't just find someone in order them to fix it. You can maybe get local commissions to work with people to fix it. And I think that's where the massive disconnect is at the moment. Is that unfair, Ian? No, it's, uh, may I, Mary? Yes, please, Ian. No, you're ab absolutely right. Uh, Vince and um, but the uh, the revisions under the um, so first of all that last paragraph that that is where we're stating specifically what the CONCOM letter was asking for between the lines in in other words um, you know we're trying to g them up to actually come down and see how many are out of compliance and they now they they are slowly moving and that's why. Uh, the concerned citizen got that uh, letter from CZM that I quoted. And if you go on to the, um, the, the waterways, the DEP's website, the um, uh, smart, storm smart properties fact sheet number seven 
repairs and reconstruction of seawalls and revetments, then it goes in and specifically says that they have to do exactly what we're discussing about. But there, there, are, um, there are no financial penalties that I'm aware of. You summed it up. Um, but I don't think, you know, that's not something we should be asking for. I think we're just focusing on the fact that we're losing public access in the intertidal zone, and which actually goes back to Roman times. Um, so it's a 2000 year old doctrine and uh, in 48 out of 50 states, uh, uh, landowners in the United States, their ownership ends um, at, the, at the high tide zone um, if there, and uh, doesn't go down the way that it does in Massachusetts and Maine. And, and, you know, and we all, I think we all know, and I don't wish to repeat myself again, that the reason for um, Massachusetts uh, and Maine was part of Massachusetts at that point in 1641, um, changing the common law that had been since time immemorial, the common law, um, was to try and promote uh, building of piers out uh, into beyond the high tide zone. And so that's how you got the public uh, trust doctrine to allow public access, despite the fact that now it was uh, considered private property up to the, the low tide zone, to the low, the low water mark. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Ian. So the, the issue that I see is that if a letter that the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee recommends is only stating the CONCOM's purpose um, in perhaps more detail, then why isn't the CONCOM sending that letter rather than the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee? I think we do have some purview because we were tasked with identifying disconnects between uh, regulations. But I think that if we're, sent, if we're asking the select board to send a letter, we're not even sending the letter ourselves. Um, we need to have it from our perspective. Uh, we need to have it from within our scope. And it seems a bit strange to me to ask the select board to send a letter that is essentially the CONCOM's position um, and the ask is coming from us and not from CONCOM. Uh, I could see an avenue where both the CONCOM and the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee sent follow-up letters, uh, but I have a hard time seeing how we would send a letter uh, you know, unofficially on behalf of the CONCOM through the select board. But you're not, you're not sending it unofficially on behalf of CONCOM, Mary. What you're doing is supporting the CONCOM letter and basically stating what would be a great help to the island and to the Conservation Commission going forward. So it's a letter of support. You know, I'm not talking about bureaucratic infighting of who's you know, every I and every T should be crossed and dotted. I'm talking about the problem that we faced as an island community wanting to keep public access in the intertidal zone in case of riding, rising sea levels. So. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Joanna and then Vince. Um, so I have just a couple of things to say, one of which is that I agree with Vince's um, you know, summary of what this means and what the impact is, particularly that last paragraph. But listening to all of this, here's my question. I'm wondering why we as a committee can't send the letter ourselves and say that we are sending the letter with that paragraph that Vince just discussed in support of the CONCOM's decision. Why do we have to go through the select board unless I'm not understanding something? Because I, I think that we do have the ability, or you know, I'm not sure if we have the right, I guess that's the question. Do we have the right to send the letter in support of the CONCOM? And then to what Vince said, I, I think that is the gist of it. And I think keeping it simple and focusing on that piece of it is most impactful. Uh, Joanna, I think that is the question that we tried to duck by saying, let's send it through the select board. We don't know if we have the right. To send the <laughs> um, and you know, anybody else can comment on that. that that's my interpretation. Uh, let's go to Joe and then Matt. Uh, Vince, are you okay waiting for other comments or did you want to jump in? Just one minor point. Um, and I don't, I'm not trying to be disparaging towards Ian. Um, I, I just don't mean to look up that fact sheet number seven. The committee has never reviewed fact sheet number seven. It's hard for us to reference fact, but it's hard for the committee to reference fact sheet number seven without ever reading it or reviewing it. I'm just going to put that out there. Thank you, Vince. Uh, Joe? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I agree with Joanne. I, 
um <laughs> i was thinking like why don't we have three separate letters i think there's more strength than having independent uh from each board but also you know going to one place i think it lets them know that there's a broader range of people that are concerned about this and board so uh yeah i guess it does come down to the question do we have that right to send a letter and i think that's a quick question for the select board you know can we send this directly which i think would have some more merit and weight um going forward so that's where i was uh and i agree with ian i think that this is important i think that this is some an issue we really need to tackle and i don't know how we get a fine <laughs> or how we change the low tide to high tide i mean i think there's a lot of things we need to work on but for sticking with this letter I think it should be independent and in but referencing and supporting the select board and the con con. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Joe. Let's go to the select board representative, Matt Fee. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we're allowed to send it either, but I think if it was joint from the select board and in, in this group, or if the select board would do their own letter, you know, it, it, like the, either of those is fine with me. Uh, I think that the uh, chapter 91, they do put, there was often a lot of uh, restrictions, things that they put on, but the, like Vince said, there is no oversight. Chapter 91 required, uh, you know, chapter 91 license required storm drains be cleaned downtown in the uh, AMP parking lot and that certain amount of car spaces and blah, 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 nobody pays attention to it. And, you know, and the stuff isn't done and then the concom will you know, we'll find out and vendor will get all upset and the con, con will do something and they'll clean it one year and then it doesn't happen again. And there's no oversight at all. So I think that, you know, that that has to be kept. If we want oversight of those things for our community, that has to be the responsibility of our community to enforce those. That's not going to come from Boston. Uh, so. Thank you, Matt. Peter and then Gary. Yes, I, I agree with what Joe said. Yes, I agree with Ian. And I, I, we're spending a lot of time, um, maybe too much time, guessing on whether we can send a letter or not. And I could just give my experience from being on the Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board. Whenever we want to send a, a letter that carries some weight like this does, um, I just check with Erica Mooney and say, since we are an advisory committee, which is what CRAC is, um, we're not necessarily, you know, running around free doing exactly what we want. And so we check with the select board um, behind the scenes by emailing Erica and saying, does this sound cool? And um, Erica will probably ask Libby and then I'll get a response that day. So maybe that's a way to go. Thank you, Peter. I think we also felt the letter would have more weight if it was signed by the select board as well as by our committee. Uh, Gary? I think uh, as uh, Peter was saying, we are an advisory committee and uh, and we're supposed to be advising, we are the advisory committee for the select board. So to me, it's likely that we'd be better sending a letter along, along with the select board, two of us being the signatories, um, since that's what our, our really charter says, we are an advisory committee. Uh, so that's my view on that. With respect to the issue itself, I guess I have a question, which is, um, that last paragraph or the last sentence that Vince commented on before that talked about the requirement of the license, uh, what would happen if the Conservation Commission just said no until you get your chapter 91 license on every application that falls within? Could they not do that? And we don't, instead of worrying about catching them after the fact, um, why, why can't the Conservation Commission just say, you need to get the approval under chapter 91 and then we can allow it to go forward. Until then, we can't approve your application. What would happen if they took that position and if we conservation commission then got sued, what would a court say? Well, if I may, Mary. Yeah. Ian, please. Um, so we, we've had this discussion, Gary, on a number of occasions and uh, the, and from the, the the lawyers representing applicants, to um, they just said that it's none of your business. And uh, we came, I think, fairly close to having an applicant sue us at um, 18 Washing Pond Road, where you know we we now have um, we we signed off on a, a, a 
on on stairs on one end and stairs that are suspended at another end, which um, are going to make it very you know very difficult to get on at low tide. Um, but there's a riprap on the eastern end, and excuse me for going into the weeds a bit, but there's riprap on the adjoining property that is up against the bulkhead there. And so the applicant said that um, they couldn't modify their design because it was somebody else's property, even though clearly the riprap had been put there specifically to protect the bulkhead. And throughout all this, we were just told it's none of our business. And so, um, you know, it's, I, I don't think Comcom wants to be sued any more than necessary. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? In other words, we felt that, uh, you know, from the advice that uh, Jeff gave us in conjunction with um, what the lawyers were saying is that it's just a completely separate issue. <clears throat> it's a state issue and that it's, uh, it's not within our jurisdiction as a conservation commission. So, which is why um, I added that final um, sentence or part of that final sentence to this letter and why I think it's important that we keep it in there. Um, and, you know, and whether they read it or not, and, well, hopefully they'll read it and whether they just toss it in the bin is who knows, but, you know, and it's also, if we go through the select board, it's, um, you know, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, it is letting the select board know, on, know what's going on. Because, in fact, the, the letter from the CONCOM didn't go through the select board. And as far as I know, the select board is unaware that we even sent a letter. Is, did that answer your question or did I just ramble too much? I apologize if I ramble too much. No, what you told me is that the Conservation Commission has the same infirmity that the select board has, is that anytime there's a tough issue and they feel they're going to get sued, they back off. And, you know, I spent my career as a, as a chief corporate legal officer for big corporations, knowing there were going to a lot of people going to hire a lawyer, they're going to sue us on these crazy theories or even unsure theories. And the answer is, if you start backing down, then people will run all over you. So, no, no Gary, please, if I may. make sure you have the best defense Gary. you can. If, if I may, yeah, if I, I, I may, let's remember I that we are not the Conservation Commission. Uh, no, yeah, no, but let moment. me <laughs> thank you, Mary. Yeah. But I think I phrased that wrong. We, we, so I, I believe I'm correct in over the thousand decisions that we've taken in the last 10 years, we've been sued 10 times or 11 times. and one every single one and so we we try to base with jeff's help we try to base our decisions on what we know is defensible and um the and with jeff's advice and i don't know whether he spoke to town council or not because in fact we've asked town council about this issue and have yet to get a reply um we decided that we did not have the legal grounds to make a decision um, that was basically within the state's purview. So that's the reason why, um, you know, we, we, we got a compromise, which was some public access. Um, but <laughs> thank you, Mary. I, I, I'm a bit at a loss for words, which seems to be a, a normal state of affairs these days. So uh, before we go to Joe, um, Ian, uh, hopefully a, a brief answer will suffice. Um, has the, is the CONCOM aware that we are intending to draft a letter on this subject? Yes, I've, okay. I've, I've told them that. Okay, and did yeah. they have any particular reaction? Why, they were uh, hopeful. Yeah, no, absolutely, as much support as possible. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to Gary. Uh, Gary, as a former CONCOM -Con member, yeah, we were never afraid of anyone. You know, we based it on the rules and regs and moved forward. I think the problem is most town boards are pretty aligned in making sure that you go forward. Of course, everyone starts at HCC and then goes on to the next boards. But I, what I think Ian's really trying to say is there's such a disconnect that we have no idea what the state is requiring or what happens and so that's where the frustrating part is. Not that we, the CONCOM, local CONCOM, changed any decision or any 
bylaw based on what chapter 91 it would eventually draw down it's based on our rules and regs um but it's it's just that unknowing we're, we're looking for your support we want to work together but i just feel like dad's just saying go away don't bother us we, we're going to do what we're going to do and don't don't you know let us hear anything about you and so i i do feel ian's frustration when i was on the board that it, it, there is no linkage you you that goes off a decision and we never hear about it or we never even hear anything before or after so that's where i think that some of the frustration comes in so i feel ian's pain because it's rehashing a lot of what i remember being on the board for six years so um yeah i just like to you know write a letter and get it in there and start moving this forward so thank you um so on on that subject um i, I also want to make everybody aware that if we're sending this letter through the select board, Vince will have to write an introduction to the select board explaining why we're sending the letter. And so we will have to, I think that is where we, we justify from the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee's charge why we're involved. Um, it sounds like the content that is in Ian's letter is preferred by the committee. Can I get a sense uh, that that is correct or not correct? Does anybody disagree with that statement? I'm not seeing any disagreement. Um, so my suggestion is that Vince and I come back with the introductory letter to the select board and uh, essentially what Ian has, although I would like an opportunity to look at our letter again and see if there's anything I wanted to add. Uh, Ian, if you don't think that that will be detrimental to your letter. Uh, no, absolutely not, Mary. And thank okay. you very much. And thank you, Vince. And thank you everybody no on the committee. For can I ask a very quick question? Yes, go ahead, Vince. Um, I'm not trying to shoot this down. I'm just trying to understand if, if I can ask Ian a question. You were, you've been told, you said it a couple of times now, you've been told that CONCOM didn't have the jurisdiction, it was none of your business, and something like uh, stay out or whatever way you phrased it. Who told you that? Was it Mass DEP? Was it uh, CZM? What organization from the state said that CONCOM doesn't have jurisdiction? No, it, it is um, that each lawyer who comes before um, CONCOM representing the applicants on asking for rebuilding of Chapter 91 licensed bulkheads states that it is not within the purview of the Conservation Commission to, uh, to render um, a, a decision on on what has been licensed so again washing 18 washing pond road there's i we have argued that and we have yet to get an opinion from town council we asked uh town council to give an opinion on the applicant's uh position was that the bulkhead itself was a structure and so was entitled to statutory protection under chapter 91 even though one, it's sticking out into the sand so you can't get around it. And two, the house that it was originally protecting is now no longer there. And that the new house that was built in 1993 is clearly you know, not, not entitled to statutory protection as a pre-1978 building. And so, and Jeff, I don't think I'm putting words in him, into his mouth when he said that he agreed that the that we have no jurisdiction over the the mass waterways chapter 91 process yeah, just so long as you weren't told by a state organization um that allayed my fear thanks okay so vince it sounds like we are going to um come back with um essentially ian's letter uh perhaps with some additional material uh and the revision that i suggested regarding the crp recommendation got it and also write the introductory cover sheet for the select board um yeah. and then we will bring that to the committee for approval yeah that cover sheet is called an ais um agenda item summary and it goes with a lot of these items and that's where i intend on putting this information okay thank you all for that discussion um, next up is the discussion of the draft third quarter Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee report to the select board. So we are now doing quarterly reports. Um, this report will cover July, August, and September. And uh, Vince and I have done a draft. Um, hopefully people have had a chance to review it. 
uh, certainly open to any additions, deletions, or adjustments to the material in the report. And then when we get to the bottom, there's always the question of what other communication do we want to have with the select board regarding requests and recommendations. Does anybody have any comments? Vince? One minor one. When I um, was uh, mentioning this before, it's the SNEP grant not, uh, I had previously said uh, um, uh, MVP grant, and I was wrong. I just want everyone to know it was SNEP. Thank you, Vince. Any comment from commission members, or does anybody want to make a motion to approve the report to be submitted to the select board? Joanna? I make a motion to approve and submit. And I just to beg your pardon, Joanna. Um, also, just checking to make sure that the requests and recommendations section, is there anything we want to add there? So these are repeating the previous. Um, thank you, Vince. <laughs> these two have been up before, and we've had other ones along the way that got resolved or in some way. All right, so seeing no request for discussion, is there a second for Joanna's motion? Second. Thank you, Peter. Um, we'll do a roll call vote. Gary Beller? Aye. Sarah Boyd? Aye. Peter Brace? Aye. Matt Fee? Aye. Ian Golding? Aye. Christy Kickham? Aye. Joanna Roach? Aye. Joe Topham? Aye. And Mary Longacre? Aye. Thank you for that. Uh, approval of minutes. So we have, uh, Vince, do we have all three sets of minutes? Just two. two steps. Okay, September 13th and 27th. Um, I do not have those on my screen, but uh, did anyone you. have any uh, corrections or um, changes to the minutes? I think I just need to add a link for the recording. Uh, Vince, what was the yellow highlight there that you just scrolled past? Oh, include in minutes. <laughs> uh, that that reminds me, um, the, Stor the Storm Smart Properties fact sheet. Uh, you mentioned, Vince, that we had not reviewed that. If it's possible for you to retrieve that and send it out to committee members um, so that they are familiar with it, that would be helpful. Doing it right now, I've already found it. <laughs> okay, we don't want to see your email though. You're sharing your screen. Yeah. Uh, okay, so do we have a motion to approve the minutes of September 13th as submitted? So moved. It's Matt. Thank you, Matt. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Joe. Roll call vote. Gary Beller? Aye. Sarah Boyce? Abstain. I wasn't there. Thank you. Peter Brace? Peter, you're on mute. Aye. Thank you. Uh, Matt Fee? Aye. Ian Golding? Yes. Christy Kickham? Aye. Joanna Roach? Aye. Joe Topham? Aye. Mary Longacre, aye. Uh, minutes of September 27th. Vince, can you throw those up? Um, if I could, Mary. Yeah. Uh, I know Rachel isn't here. Rachel did these uh, ones. She did them in one note. Um, I have no familiarity with that program whatsoever and an inability to edit it. So um, if there are any edits that are needed, um, I'll have to make notes on it because I can't edit. Okay. Uh, I may be able to assist. I think we can convert that to Word somehow. Uh, Matt has a hand up, Matt. Matt, you're on mute. Yeah, I'll make a comment on the previous, the, uh, oh, the the fact sheet that was there. I think that if we haven't looked at it, people should. Uh, I th What is amazing to me is some of the, you know, rock revetment type stuff that the state is sort of showing pictures of and the angles and all this. Uh, it, it's it, it's frightening to me that's, you know, that those are the, the way they are compared to some of the things that we're doing. And so I think people need to look at that and think about it uh it's it's kind of crazy so that's all thank you matt quick uh, quick one Mary. um yeah. if anyone in the public needs it send me an email and i'll, I'll forward it on okay uh so back to the minutes of separate 
September 27th. Did anybody have any comments or changes to these minutes? All right, if there are none, we'll take a motion to approve. So moved. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Joanna, for seconding. Roll call vote, Gary Beller. Aye. Sarah Boyce. Abstain. Peter Brace. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. Ian Golding. Aye. Christy Kickham. Aye. Joanna Roach. Aye. Joe Topham. Aye. And Mary Longacre, aye. Uh, okay, so we do not have minutes yet for October 11th. Uh, so we come to public comment on the agenda. Are there any members of the public who are present and want to make a comment? Um, you can use the raise hand feature or we have a small group. You can unmute and let us know that you have a comment. Um, Mary, it's Deanne. Yes, Deanne. Uh, yes, thank you. And thank you committee for all of your good work. Um, I just want to focus on the um, sediment transport study. Um, it's good to hear that the proposal has been written, the RFP has been written, and that it's pending. As you also know, the funding is already in place. Um, last spring at town meeting, town meeting appropriated $550,000 for um, island-wide sediment transport study. It's one of the key priorities in the Coastal Resilience Plan, as you've already discussed. And I'm just wondering if the, if CRAC could be helpful um, in moving it along to the next step, which I think is putting the RFP out for bid. Um, we just don't want to get that held up internally unnecessarily. Thank you, Dan. We are doing what we can. Thank you. Uh, other public comment? Seeing none. Uh, next item is new business, uh, Committee and Natural Resources Department reports. Um, Vince, you had something you wanted to mention here. Uh, just a minor follow up. I wanted um, the committee to hear about the symposium in December. I'm also going to be um, an invited guest speaker at that one. And um, as far as I know, I'm going to be talking about the uh, the Baxter Road area as an as um, an example for attendees. Thank you, Vince. Um, so, quick question: Did anybody attend the Martha's Vineyard Coastal Conference? It was on October 24th yesterday, and I believe it was in person on Martha's Vineyard. Vince? No, uh, I wasn't there. Yeah, okay. Uh, Sarah? I was just going to say, I had a few weeks ago was planning on going and then realized there's no physical way to get to Martha's Vineyard for the day. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't worth spending a night in Hyannis on Sunday. I just, but I do, I, I wrote to Vince to say, I really do think that our crack committee should get together with the Martha's Vineyard planning people and the Falmouth planning people. And I think we should I would recommend planning a meeting that is like obviously could be open to the public because we're a town committee, but if we could have it be really focused on these advisory and planning groups rather than the whole of everybody, um, I think that would really help um, with some of the issues instead of constantly reinventing the wheel. I mean, we, we're learning from other communities generally, but I would, I would feel like we would benefit from talking with other communities directly. Yeah, I, I don't know if Hyannis has uh, specifically a committee, but they would be the ones that are most important to us because they're the other end of the Steamship Authority. And so any impact that the Steamship Authority is going to feel from climate change, um, you know, it, it, impact on either side of the route affects Nantucket. Um, so that's definitely an area I'd want to pursue. Uh, Peter? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mary. Um, report from the Harbor and the Shellfish Advisory Board um, at our last meeting. We appointed uh, our member Dave Franzuto to the uh, Harbor Action Plans um, Update Committee. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Christy? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to give an update from uh, my last Capital Committee meeting um, based on a former uh, 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 a discussion we had in this group here and uh, pertaining to the sewer beds. Um, uh, as the as the beach encroaches on the sewer beds, there is an item in the uh, sewer um, uh, account well, 
for uh, next uh, next season for a five hundred thousand um, um, dollar, you know, funding for uh, looking at uh, moving some of those uh, beds uh, and creating some new ones. So that price, that cost will probably go up, but it is a start, and you know, they are uh, looking at uh, starting that um, process of uh, of planning. Uh, the other thing that uh, came up is that there's now a new emphasis on stormwater and they are creating uh, uh, their own uh, enterprise fund for specifically stormwater. So I think over the next uh, five years, there's gonna be a, a huge emphasis and push on understanding stormwater better than what we have. Um, you know, not so much a uh, revenue generated enterprise fund, but they're looking at those options as well. As you know, a lot of construction sites do dump into the sewer, uh, into the stormwater, um, you know, significantly. So, um, but also a very in interesting component as far as uh, water is concerned. Thank you, Christy. Those are great updates. Um, Vince, we may ask David Gray from the sewer department to tell us more about that initiative. Uh, I don't know what the appropriate timing would be. You know, it might not be for a year. Um, but certainly you could have a conversation with him to find out. Other updates from committee members? I, just, I have a question. Yes, Joanna. Um, I, I came a little bit late, so I didn't hear if Niall said this or not. How can you go to the symposium in December? I say that the 8th is public, but what about the other days? I, I believe he said that there are two days of internal meetings for the people who are invited to come to the island, and then on the third day, the Friday, there will be public sessions. Okay, got it. I was just clarifying. Thank you. Now, you could always speak to him and ask for an yeah. invitation. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I can add from the NPNADC that we appointed Seth Engelborg to the Mattakit and Nantucket Harbors um, Action Plan Update Committee. Um, if there is nothing else, I, I did note, uh, and I wanted to offer a thank you to the Youth Climate Committee at the high school for continuing their activities. Um, Veritas reported on the climate walkout that they had. Um, so I'm very glad to see that. Matt? Uh, I'm not sure, but for a future meeting, I would like, I think we need to start talking about zoning and how do we tackle that and how are we influencing that. I think we spend a lot of time on you know, people and their individual buildings and other stuff. And it's, that's great. You know, I think it's important, but I think our time at some point has to be spent with, you know, with the planning department and on, you know, on what are we going to do in areas that are, uh, you know, uh, you know, are going to be under pressure, you know, what, how are we going to, you know, sort of stop going forward, you know, forget retreat, how are we going to stop going forward? How, you know, first, and that's, I think that should be a priority in some manner. So, you yeah, know, that's for all of us to think about, but at some point we need to figure out how we're going to tackle those issues. Thank you, Matt. And that is one of the CRP recommendations and certainly something that uh, we can start to make progress on. So uh, Vince, it might be helpful if you would um, prepare sort of a, a summary of what we already know other communities have done for zoning. Uh, that we may have seen in their coastal zones plans, or we may be aware of okay. uh, starting point. Um, yes, yeah, that's a discussion um, we can certainly I, begin. Um, it, that sounds like a, a lot to research, and I have some of it. And if I could ask for some assistance from some committee members to help research it, that'd be terrific, please. All right. Anyone who feels uh, comfortable in that area can reach out to Vince. Yeah, my, yeah it's Matt again. My other point is we should also ask what is what are we you know maybe we don't have to reinvent the wheel what is you know planning and mp and edc doing right now toward that maybe there are there maybe it's underway and we just don't know about it so we could also ask them to come and present you know what you know what they've studied what they know and what they plan on doing and we can see if that's sufficient there may be another way to tackle it rather than us to do it twice Right, that's what I was thinking we might be able to crib off some other people's um, already implemented solutions. Um, okay, so next item, uh, next meeting dates are November 8th and 22nd. The 22nd is the week of Thanksgiving. Uh, November so 8th is election day, you know that. 
Um, I was planning on voting early, so I wasn't paying that much attention. I guess you're not poll watching then, huh? <laughs> no. Um, I don't think that that will be enough of a conflict to change the date, but if anybody feels otherwise, we can discuss that. I'm not available that day, but others. Okay. All right, so if you're not available on the 8th or 22nd, please make sure Vince is aware. Uh, and then we are planning meeting December 13th, but not on the 27th. If there are any other suggestions for upcoming topics, Sarah? Sorry, so this was just a going back for a sec because I was typing. Are we meeting the 22nd or not? Because you said it's Thanksgiving week. I, I missed what you said about that. Uh, just letting as, asking people to let Vince know if they were not available, oh, but okay. we would plan to meet on the 22nd unless we know we won't have a quorum. Thank you. All right, we'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay, second. Hi, <laughs> Sarah. Roll call vote, Gary Beller. Aye. Sarah Boyce. Aye. Peter Brace. Okay, uh, Peter raised his hand on mute. Um, Matt Fee. Aye. Ian Golding. Aye. Christy Kickham. Aye. Joanna Roach. Aye. Joe Topham. Aye. And Mary Longacre, aye. Thank you all. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Cheers, everyone. All right, I'm going to end the recording if that's right, Mary. Yep. <laughs>